Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. From the Ender Groove Remains production team videos in the Netherlands. My name is Mixmaster G and welcome to this live stream. For those of you who are new to this stream, uh, I am a 55, 54 year old from the Netherlands. I always about what's my get counting after I became 20. Uh, I had my first DJ residence. So you are looking at almost 40 year experience in the flash. Uh, I'm no longer okay. However, each day I am online in this which Facebook channel to answer all and every question you may have about the tech side of being a DJ uh, and sharing the knowledge I accumulated over the past years. This time I'm not alone. With me is my close friend Jeroen Groenendrijk, who is product manager at Pioneer. Let me. I can get the visual. That's Jeroen. 
And we can even go together, but I have to see which one is which. We can do duo presentations. We can, we can do duo presentations. And the last time Jung was a guest over at my place, we had some mic trouble, so please think that the audio is not on par. Let us know in the chat, because then we can try to fix it. Uh, today is kind of a light, or this week is holiday week all over the globe, which means are very, very, very light very on DJ-related tech news. The only thing that is news is this thing, uh, the DJ, DJ 1000 off-white, looks like that. Uh, and to be honest, I don't regard that as because it's another color thing. And all right, it looks nice or it doesn't look nice. It's just a matter of taste, of course, and you can't air argue with taste. But besides that, not much to tell about. Of course, there was other news. Uh, for instance, uh, Bezos, the boss of the channel, mind you, became uh, an astron astronaut today, was launched into space and uh, safely landed back. And the Bitcoin went under the $30,000 in value. But hey, we are looking. So I brought Jeroen with me today. Jeroen is a product manager pioneer in Europe. Uh, and that means Jeroen knows all things Pioneer DJ. If you're talking about CDJs, if you're talking about record box, Jeroen knows it all. There is one thing that Jeroen cannot answer, and that is, hey, when does the CDJ 5000 come out? When will the DDJ uh, 350 come out? Simply because Jeroen cannot share that information if he already might have that information. Other rule Jeroen and I always have, uh, Jeroen is a pioneer DJ employee which means that if it's possible doing certain tasks pioneer DJ art and software he will always promote that instead of alternatives. I'm a free spirit so I'm for everything else so sometimes Jeroen have to has to divert to me over for the more objective point of view but hey that is how we roll. Uh, Jeroen let me give you the microphone and just introduce yourself for the part I forgot about. Well, I don't think there's uh, a lot that you forgot about, uh, Peter, other than uh, perhaps the belt pack because it's almost running out. Um, but uh, no, my name is Jeroen. I will save you my last name because it's way too difficult to pronounce. Um, as Peter says, I'm the product specialist at Pioneer DJ. I've been doing this work since 1999. So I've been introducing all, all the products after CJ 1000. In a 1000 to the fish market. I'm also the guy that tries to educate a lot of the uh, people in the Netherlands and try to help them as much as I can get rolling with their hobby and get going as fast as they can. Um, other than that, I am a DJ since 92. Then I bought something that was a belt driven turntable. Uh, a lot of the DJs now probably don't even know a belt driven turntable. I don't even know them, but um, most of the decks you now see have direct drive. But if you want a real challenge, find just that of uh, JB2000. That was my starter deck and try to spin some records. It's going to be a, it's gonna be a good one. Um, besides that, uh, I had a uh, technical school, so I've learned actually very electronic, so that's also why I'm a, sometimes a little bit a tech geek, but that's why I like coming here with her. We are both tech geeks, and I think we can keep each you other in balance. I, so, sorry, I have to interrupt you for a little bit. Uh, what I was afraid of is it happening. Our thresholds are cancelling each other out, so I'm going to lower the threshold and let's use our mutes uh, just to make sure that our mics are not picking each other up, because we are using very expensive mics. The problem with very expensive mics is that they are super sensible. So they're very good. And they are very good and we really like them. But my mic is picking up Jeroen when he is talking. Jeroen's mic is picking up my, me as I'm talking, which makes it a bit of a cacophony. Uh, so I'm going to lower the thresholds. We were experimenting with the thresholds, but we were pressed a little bit short on time. Uh, so we didn't really, really, really test it, but we want you guys here is correct, so that means we are going to manually mute and unmute here, and I will lower that. So sorry to interrupt you, Jeroen, but just making sure that you know what's going on. 
Is that, yeah, there, there he goes. Here we go again. Uh, so you will see me with the belt pack and turning it on and off and all the way uh, back and forth. Back and forth. Uh, again, next time we will be doing some testing again. We did improve on last time, uh, but we didn't have all the time for us to check. I hope with the adjustments now making that we sort out the levels, that the level that you will be, we be, you will be receiving is okay. And we just do the manual mute thing if the other guy is going to do uh, a lot of the talking. Um, let me fill in some time because you just we, saw we, we, the... We are already good, my friend. We should be good. You should mute, mute, mute now, because now because I'm talking and I... Yeah, I see. Uh, first of all, Anthony, thank you very much for uh, telling us uh, we should be good with the audio now. The moment uh, we understand that we have to manually go back and forth. Uh, Kevin, welcome to the stream, my friend. Uh, so, uh, Jeroen and I were talking about, all right, what are we going to do uh, to show the guys that they might not know about? And Jeroen came up with the suggestion, let's dive into the editor that is built into Recordbox, because that's a function that I know I never use, but Jeroen says, no, it, it is really a useful tool. Uh, so then my word to Jeroen is always, all right, convince me. Uh, so this is basically Jeroen convincing me of the usefulness of the editor in Recordbox, and in the process, we might all learn something. In the meantime, the chat is open for all and every question. It doesn't have to be Pioneer DJ only, but we would appreciate it if you pump over those Pioneer questions because that is where we are here for and that's why Jeroen came over. So let's be, be there for that. Uh, how is it? Kevin, is the, is the feedback echo there still? Because Kevin is now saying nice feedback echo, but there should not be a feedback echo at all. So Kevin, can you tell me if the feedback echo is there or if it's gone? My mic was muted, so my mic could not give any um, any hints. Um, we just continue, just pretend everything will be okay. Um, one note that I first want to place about the edit mode. This is part of the creative uh, subscription model. So please don't get it wrong. This is not included in the free version of Recordbox, unfortunately. But this is one of the features that you will get if you have the creative mode and because I think a lot of people might not even investigate on it I wanted to show a little bit um, about it um, actually I need to switch the screens that's Peter's task so I'll just uh, give you a short text information now hold on Peter uh, give you a short text information what is the edit mode the edit mode is not a replacement for your logic this is not a replacement for an advanced audio suite what it is me meant for is for quick edits. Um, you're gonna, you can cut stuff out of tracks very easily. You can create like a new remix. You can add stuff or copy parts of a track. It's, I would more compare it to single track editing in Ableton because that's actually what it uh, uh, looks like most. Uh, when I go into record box, I will show you how I will get to this edit uh, screen. You're there. Perfect. Um, this is record box like you probably, um, you, you probably know it, just the record box. And here on the uh, top left, uh, let me turn on the turn off because what you see is a lot of the tooltips. Uh, let me show you what I'm going to deactivate because I'm going to deactivate the tooltips. Um, if you don't have them, this is the way how to activate them so you're not getting bothered by that uh, pop-up. If you look on the top left, there is this selector and this is how you toggle the modes. You probably know the export mode because that's what you make uh, used to create a USB. If you can also change it to the performance mode if you are using uh, any of the controllers to work with record box. Uh, lighting is something for a different day, but now the uh, bottom section is the editor. And when you go to the editor, you think nothing has happened. But this is something different. You have a tab here that's the browser, and you can select a track and load the track just like you did, and then close the browser because now we want to see um, the whole screen. This is the track that I just have, and mind you that um, we were testing. One of the things that I didn't have is the audio on the speaker, so uh, we're going to just walk all over it. But you have a section on the top. This is your waveform, just like you have in the normal 
editor, this is the maximum waveform and here is where you have the toolbars. On the right side you have something that's called a palette and in this palette you can place parts of this track. As again what I say, it's a one track editor, there's no multi-track options so you cannot uh, double tracks but if uh, I check this track and you will probably hear the intro of this track. And it's a beat loop without any kicks in it. Let's say I want this track to start with a beat. So I'm going to look for a beat and if you look in the waveform, by the way the waveform color that I'm using here is the new tree band color in uh, record box. This will show the lower frequencies in blue, the higher frequencies in amber or orange and the high frequencies in, 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 in white. So if I have this track and if I, if I, if I would be playing it Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's play. Okay. Um, let's say I want to cut off the start of this track, like this whole intro bit is bothering me. I can just select this track, go all the way to the beginning, select the whole uh, beat and I can do several things. One of the things that I can do, I can drag it on the right to the palette and drop this bit of audio in my palette. You will see a waveform will be built up, so you see it perfectly over there. Now I'm going to use the buttons on the screen. Let's say I want to remove this intro bit, so I'm going to delete it. You will see that the waveform will be drawn again and this track is now starting, now starting with the kick just as I wanted it. And perhaps let's say that if you will see a little bit further on that there's this little break here again. Perhaps you don't want it and you want the track to continue with percussion. We just use the, the small zoom buttons over here. And we're going to select, uh, let's say, this whole bit that you want to remove. And you press, well, you can copy it to the side, just for case. Then you can delete it. And now this track. As you can hear, it makes the cuts almost not uh, audible. That's because this track is gridded with the beat grid that we have in record box, so it's uh, tempo based. And this whole editor is cutting quantized on the beat grid, so it's very hard to make, uh, to make a mistake. If you uh, want to spoil around with the break, you can Grab this whole thing, place your marker where you want to know that the cut's going to be. Go to the end, shift, zoom in. And whatever, you can drop it on the side, you can delete it. And let's say that that, uh, that beat from the beginning is what you want to put in, re in, in place. So you can drop that, that bit, put it there and you will see that the waveform is going to uh, rebuild and now this track has an edit. If you want to, for example, at the end, this track, let's say, has a too short run out time, so you want to have more time at the end to, uh, to do your mixing, you just grab this bit with a beat. Oh, once, one longer. And you can say clone. And now it just put this bit extra behind it. Clone it two more times, so then we have 32 bars beats. Now I've extended this track with almost a minute of time that you can use to do uh, the mixing. I will sh let you hear one time to one of the crossing, so you hear the audio is being cut perfectly. almost hitting the repeat point. Point. 
and this is the way how you can create like a, a very small edit, a remix or whatever what you want. There's even more buttons because you have um, the beat select, you can drop your needle and select a certain bit of 32 bits or 16 uh, uh, beats, just how you want to cut it. Most of the time I'm using my mouse and my keyboard because my eyes are most of the time faster, but if you want to have a straight 32 beats loop, you just drop the point 32 and this is your 32. You don't even have to bother where it's going to end. All these bits on the side are in your project. So if you want to, let's say you want to save this file, you could save it as a project. So you go to File, Save As. And you will see that it will be, it's called an RBEP extension, but this is a project file. Recordbox by itself creates a folder for you in the Pioneer DJ folder that's normally within your uh, music folder. There's this Pioneer DJ folder and then there's the edit projects and these are your project files. Uh, what you could also do at the end, because if you have if when you make a remix like this, at the end you want to bounce this track and have it in your collection. So you're going to go to File, Render Audio File. These are your settings that you can do. Whatever. And then say Render. And now Recordbox is going to render this audio file and it's going to create a waveform. Mind you, I should not have saved it as a waveform file because the original of this file is an mp3 and if you save mp3 as waveform that's actually something you don't, sh you should not do. Uh, but this is the way how you can save uh, the files. When you leave the edit mode, you go back to export and do whatever your playlist preparation. When you go back to the uh, edit mode, your project is still there. If you want to close the project, you can hit the close button here on the left top or you can go to the file and then uh, close it automatically. These are in a rough line the things that you can do with the edit mode in Recordbox. There are some easy tools uh, that you can see in the bottom to do the copying and uh, pasting. Most of the times I'm using my keyboard, but this is in, an, in a nutshell, a very fast explanation of what the edit mode is and a little bit of an explanation what you can do with it. All right, Jeroen. All right, so, so, so oh, your audio is on. <laughs> Thanks. So if I correctly understand you, you don't override your original file. Your original track stays the way it is. You create, at worst case, an extra new file and then uh, the things you did, the automation, if you are used to, to Ableton. No it's not an automation file, but, but, but actually... Uh, sorry, the, there is no automation because automation... Ah, sorry. <coughs> yeah, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, well, there's no automation because you cannot automate like a volume control or balance control. It's pick and place the bits and pieces of a track and one, once I saved it, when I go to my record box and if I will be looking for ATGR, you will see that the version that I just created is here in the player, you will see this little icon, this is indicating that this track is an edit of the original um, and it just keeps the name and the, and the tempo that we used before, if we go back to export mode. I can just uh, load this track and you will see that uh, I have the track loaded with the additional bits on the end and the bits in the beginning cut off. So this track now starts with a direct kick. So if I correctly understand this, this relies on your beat grid, especially uh, if you are using dynamic tracks or disco tracks, etc. The beat grid should be flawless because the beat grid is actually the guide for the editor to, to, de to depend on what is cut and what is not cut? Or can you go off quantize, uh, uh, off quantize li like we can with CDJs for instance and just freely make any selection you like? If you look at the top of the screen, let, let me get another track here. <coughs> Select, uh, sorry. This is what you come across when you will be having it at home. In the top, 
If in the bottom left, there's this little bit browser, this is what you want to press if you want to load a new track. You can use your playlist just like you use. I'm just going to get uh, the same track. And on the top here, you have your quantize setting. And that's a uh, red cue. It's the same indication that you have in your record box. You can turn it off. Hey. Well, let me rephrase that. You cannot turn it off. So for now, I have to dive into it a little bit more, but for now quantize is not optional. It's obligated. So you make sure that your beat grids are properly aligned. Yeah, well, well, what I said, you solely rely on, on, on the correctness of the beat grid. If the beat grid is not correct, then the whole process is a problem. It's not a problem, it's not a problem but it's, it's going to take you a lot more effort because if your beat grids are not properly aligned, um, uh, it was a question I had to ask because I'm, I'm sure you can disable the quantize, but make sure for now that you got your grids properly set up. Most of the time when a grid is not aligned perfectly, first thing I always try is to reanalyze that track because then it's analyzed with the latest engine that you're currently using and most of the time that sorts it out. Otherwise, um, if a track is something, I'm going to toss in another tip, is if you have a track and you would be using a manual adjustment of the beat grid, well, let me get, I don't care, what, whatever track. Uh, let's say that you want the beat grid to be aligned a little bit different. Uh, it, 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 you find it this way after the normal analyze and it's not correcting, then you're just going to go to the point where you want to make your cue. I'm using the, the keyboard for it, so I'm pressing C, then I'm pressing C again to trigger it. Well, I think it sounds uh, okay. So with this button, I align the beat grid. But this is, if you have to do this after analyzing, there's something that's bothering the analyzer. On the, in the center, you have this little icon with a padlock. If you press it now, the beat grid for this track will be locked. And even if you're going to do an analyze again, it's not going to move uh, the beat grid because this track will not be analyzed again because you locked the beat grid. All right. All right. Any plans or are you aware or are you, are you allowed to speak about any future plans for this feature uh, in Recordbox? For instance, uh, Kevin Bescher is asking, uh, can we expect uh, at least a two-track version so you can create mashups, etc., in Recordbox using the tracks you have analyzed in Recordbox? On the short time, I would not count on it. This is Pioneer's first version of this editor. I'm happy with how it works right now. Of course, I would also love a second layer because it would be awesome if you could use the intro of a track without a kick and overdub it over the first bit that does have a kick. I see a lot of opportunities for that. You can recreate the break with a beat in the backdrop, but for now this is not possible and there's nothing known about if and when such a feature would be uh, coming to record box. All right, so, All right, so the base purpose of the editor would be indeed to cut off intros uh, by a certain amount so you have a perfectly aligned track to mix in at any point you like or like you just did, did to create an outro for mixing out uh, stuff like that just a word processor for audio files yes it is, yes, it, this is not meant as your DAW that you're going to use in your whole workflow to create a lot of stuff. This is for the quick edits. You just got this new track, you want to play it this evening, but the break in the middle is way too long or too short or whatever your comment is for this track. And you can use Recordbox to make a quick edit of this track so it fits your playing purpose better. It's not meant to create uh, like a, a, a full track with multiple layers and a volume control per layer, an equalizer per layer. I would love for that to be in Recordbox, but to be honest, there's programs available that are dedicated to that job. And for now, you can better use uh, programs like uh, Ableton or Audition or whatever audio editor you are using. All right, that, that's all clear. Uh, because the beat grid is so important uh, in this particular editor or in this particular feature for Recordbox, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into 
how you set a beat grid in Rackedbox because I see a lot of people fighting Rackedbox to get a beat grid correctly set and it is basically a very simple process. Uh, let's load up a random track. And we didn't prepare this, so I will head over to Jeroen in a moment because Jeroen is far better in this stuff than I am. Uh, what is always important if you are setting a grid, the red vertical line is always your first grid. That's the beat marker. That is actually the starting point where the new segment or where the segment starts, where the BPM is set. Because a lot of people forget that actually the BPM is the grid or the grid is the BPM. It's one and the same thing. However, a track can have multiple BPMs within it. So for instance, this is a 120 BPM steady track. But let's say at this kick, we actually want to make it 130 or we think it's 130 instead. Then we can set 130 right here, but that will change the whole BPM to 130. That is not what you want to do. What you want to do is the part to the right of my beat marker, make that the 130. For that you have to press this thing and that is where I always go wrong and that's why I'm just putting some extra emphasis on it, just that you know that it's available. If you press this little thingy, then you tell Rackedbox basically, we are going to work only to the stuff to the right of the beat marker. So I set a new beat marker right here. I can make it 130. And there you can see it. This part lost its beat marker now. And that's what I mean with I always have to fight it. This is 120, as you can see. 120 there, 120 there. And then the moment we pass it right here, we have a 130 there, which is 130 there which is what we call a dynamic beat grid. For this track, it doesn't make much sense to see it, but it is very important that you understand with this little thingy, you can say, all right, I only want to work to the right of my cursor, to the right of where I am at and not to the left part. I will leave that open, but maybe Jeroen can say something useful about that as well. So I will move to Jeroen's computer. Um, yeah, I think you, you did explain that, that feature pretty well uh, because indeed that's that little button that locks everything on the left side of the marker and edit it on the right. And by the way, if you look at the top right of record box, that's actually the current BPM where the playhead is positioned. If you look at the BPM in that lower strip, that's the beat grid bar. So that's where you use to adjust uh, the beat grid. Uh, but I want to add a little bit more on this because of the um, dynamic and normal analysis. Because what Peter just showed you was if a track has a, at a certain point a tempo increase or a tempo change. You want to lock everything before it and then you're going to make the adjustments after that. I have a track here. Um, warning, this is a hardcore track. I don't have any other track as an example. But this track, if it is being analyzed uh, fresh, um, then this track will have a constant BPM throughout the whole track because I do a normal analysis. So you will see at the beginning that this bit is 129 BPM and here at the end you will see it's still 129 and, and some. But I know that in this break there's a tempo change. And what you could do is what Peter just showed you. You find the beat grid over here, you go to a proper place, and now you will see on the left side, you will see these blue lines, and on the right side. But if I press that button Peter was talking about, you will see that on the left side of my needle, the markers will change. Now it are only little dots, meaning this is locked, and the blue you can still adjust. So if you're going to do the, uh, the thing that adjusts uh, the tempo, you want to change the distance between the beat grid markers, you will see everything after the marker changes. But this is a lot of work and it's not always perfectly good to get it the way you want it. So this is why Pioneer has the dynamic analysis. And here on the bottom right of the waveform is something, I call it a hamburger menu. That's just because hamburgers. Um, <laughs> But you can choose 
I did do the normal analysis, but when I choose dynamic analysis, Recordbox is going to decide after each bit grid marker where it's going to place the next one. So analyzing will take a little bit more time. If I do that, I run it through this track, and this track will be analyzed again. And what I want to make sure is in the beginning, you will see that in the beginning of the track, this is not yet the new waveform, That's a new waveform. Now you will see that in the beginning of the track, the beat grids are marked properly. And let's see now on hand. Oh, that is a leuke, Peter. What have you? 97 BPM. Sorry, guys, I will talk um, English, but I see something strange. But I see the beat grid mark uh, properly. And again, we can't hear the audio here, but I'm assuming everything would be okay. Uh, this is called the metronome. If you activate it, you will get the bleep on the first on every beat marker. If I do it in the beginning, you will hear perfectly on the beat. Also, before the break, uh, the audio is not working here, but you will see it's also pretty good. Now, when I play this bit in the break, you will hear a uh, match of the beat grid. Bleep, bleep, bleep and you hear the track doing the increase bit. During the break, there's a battle going on in between those two, but I'm only concerned in what happens on the first kick after the break. Let's see what Recordbox makes out of it. only concerned when the kick drops. Mm. And you will see it's um, it's it's a lot better. One of one of the things that I here the BPM on top right is not correct, guys. When you look at the bottom left, it's 160, and in the beginning, it's 130. And I think my record box is a little bit uh, messed up. I should restart record box, but that's what you do before you go start a stream. But this is how dynamic and normal analysis can help you in conjunction with that button Peter was talking about to mark up your beat grids. So if dynamic normal analysis doesn't work, Perhaps dynamic fixes it if you have uh, changing BPM throughout the track. The uh, thing you just experienced with the BPM is a thing a very common experience with, with Recordbox. Uh, for me, for me, all after all the demos I gave, this is the very first time I have not. I do not see the same value over here as I, as I see over here. But I can imagine it happens more often. For me, it's yeah, the first. Usually, yeah. when, when, when I'm doing my conversion uh, stuff, that means that I have to check what happens at various BPM tempos, and then I just make random grids, much like you just did. And then, at a certain point, Recordbox will lose all <laughs> all analysis and just makes up its own BPM. Uh, interesting question from Kevin uh, coming in, and a thing uh, we spoke about uh, before we went live on the air because. We always have our little McDonald moment. That is why Jeroen was so happy that he finally saw a burger. He didn't see a burger today. There was a burger there in his own menu. Uh, but uh, Jeroen is asking, uh, I'm in the market for a V10, uh, but in Germany, uh, there is no retailer who can deliver it. The closest delivery times that are uh, quoted right now are February. Uh, how realistic is that? And I'll leave that answer to you, my friend. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, a long back order on certain of our products. Well, at the end, in the beginning of the whole situation, there was no back orders. At this point in time, a lot of the key products are unfortunately not available and the suggested delivery time could be, um, it could, should, could not be even that far off. And the same goes for 
uh, the V10 that you are asking for for the Nexus 2, those mixers have issues and it will take some while before they drop in. We have, there's quite some back orders and we are trying to fight to get additional units, but there's a production issue and that's not only for Pioneer, but that's for all the electronics manufacturers. There's a shortage of certain parts and all the manufacturers are fighting for those parts in the international market. Other than that, there's also when the units are being produced, they also need to be shipped to Europe and international cargo is also a challenge at this point in time. So there's challenges that we cannot do anything about and we wish uh, we could give you a little bit of better news, but unfortunately we have some delivery times on most of our products, unfortunately, and there's little that we can do about it. Yeah, that, yeah. that is a shame, yeah. but it is the situation we see ourselves in worldwide after the pandemic, uh, and Pioneer DJ is not the only company facing this issue. However, in Pioneer's, uh, to Pioneer's credit, they at least quote it honestly. They don't say next week, next week, when they know it's not going to be next week. They just say frankly, we don't know yet. We cannot give you a, a, a real uh, solid date. Uh, the only thing I can uh, say to you, Kevin, is if you have decided that you want that V10, order it because that makes sure that you are on the list and that when the stuff comes in, that you are going to receive one because you can imagine there are a lot of potential customers much like yourself uh, who are waiting until they've get, they get a final shipment confirmation before ordering and then most likely that shipment confirmation will not be there because if we are going to uh, get supplies in again that will most likely uh, mean that it will be only enough to meet the backlog and not enough to make stock. So my only uh, suggestion to you, Kev, would be order it if you like it. Yeah. It's a it's great mixer, great. so uh, I didn't have the I space for it or I would have it, but I, I like to have my coffins and uh, that's the main reason why I did, did pick uh, Axone DB4 over the V10. Uh, and my Nexus 2, 900 Nexus 2 is still uh, more than adequate to handle every audio I, I, I throw at it and more. Uh, and other, uh, let, and other let, let me add a little bit about the, uh, the products, uh, Peter, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Europe is supplied from the same warehouse. It does not matter in which country you are placing your order. All the countries are equal and all the countries get equal parts of the stock that will arrive. It is not, it doesn't give you any advantage if you order it in like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, because at the end all the countries are supplied by the same warehouse. If, <coughs> if there is supply coming in Europe, it will be divided to all the dealers that we have assigned to. So it doesn't matter, there's no dealer that has an advantage over the other. Also, I would, if you want the mixer and you made your choice, order it at the dealer in your area because he's also being able to supply you with the service that comes with the product. So just, if you want it and if you made your choice, just order it somewhere and then you're on the line. I come across people more often and then it's like, yeah, it's not on stock, yeah, I, oh, okay, I will wait with order. And then three months later, yo, Jeroen, is it already on stock? No, okay, if you don't order, it's going to take a while because to be honest, no one knows how the future on the short term or mid long term is going to look like. And it's very hard to predict anything in the future. So if you want that mixer, you're convinced, you know, the mixer covers all the features that you want, place the order at your local dealer and just wait for it. It, it will get there. It will get there, but it's, it uh, doesn't give you any advantage ordering it in a certain area because no matter what people say, everybody supplies from the same warehouse. So it doesn't matter in which country or at which dealer you do, I'll accept, order it at an official dealer. If you look on pioneerdj.com, if you go to uh, shops, make sure that the party that you are ordering your unit is mentioned on that list because those are the certified dealers uh, that we put our hands in the fire for. All right, then uh, another question comes from AC uh, over YouTube. 
uh, when can we expect a native version, an M1 native version of Rackerbox? Uh, let me uh, give my uh, opinion about that because you cannot do too much future uh, predictions. Uh, the problem is this. Uh, with Apple moving to the M1 platform, which means there's a totally different processor inside that particular Apple, uh, there is basically different software required to run on it. Uh, that software should be compiled for the M1 ARM processor. And right now everything is compiled for the Intel processor. Uh, Apple fixed that by using something called a Rosetta 2. Uh, like the stone of Rosetta was this stone that made it possible to read ancient languages. Rosetta 2 makes it possible to let ancient code run on the new ARM processor. That's why it's called Rosetta, right? Uh, the problem here is that, of course, if you are going to emulate something, uh, that makes things slower. On the other hand, the ARM processor is much more efficient than an Intel processor is, so that should take someone out, but it does mean you're not using the computer at its maximum capable specification. Now, here is the issue. If you are a Pioneer DJ, or if you are a Serato, or if you are a Native Instruments, then you develop your software in an environment that is capable to compile the exact same code for Windows PCs and for Mac OS PCs. Uh, makes sense, right? Because you don't want two development teams. You want to have one development team that makes a coherent product that works the same on every platform. Here is the kicker. There is at this moment no multi-platform environment that is capable to take all the code of the old stuff and then compile it into ARM, Intel Mac and Windows Mac. Because don't forget, if you look around at your fellow DJs, they are using MacBook Pros which are 10 years old, which are 12 years old. You can imagine that if Recordbox 8 comes out, that they still want to run that on those Intel MacBook Pros and they still want to run it on Windows and they want to run it on M1. Uh, so the thing is, first of all, there need to be development environments capable of compiling to ARM, uh, M1 ARM processor Max and also capable to compile to the other platforms. It must be code compatible at a very huge level because otherwise it doesn't make sense. They are not going to build a record box from scratch just for the M1 Macintosh computers. Uh, in short, we have to wait and see what is going to happen. Right now, I can predict that there comes a time that Apple is going to drop Rosetta 2 from the new operating system. It is still there in Monterey, so in the next operating system after Big Sur, Rosetta 2 is still there. I can imagine it will be there at the one next to Monterey, but after three uh, generations of OS, after three years, I know, because that's what Apple always do, did, that they are going to drop Rosetta. And at that point in time, the developers must have made up their mind are we going to stick with the M1 or are we going to drop support for it altogether? It's just a matter of numbers. If Apple sells tons and tons of those computers, then developers will develop for it. Uh, if the majority of Macs used by DJs are still Intel-based computers, then there is really no reason to develop for it. So the answer to that question, when will that be there? First of all, the development environments need to be there. Those need to be the development environments that are currently used by Pioneer DJ. I happen to know which one that are, but I'm not going to put that in a public broadca broadcast. Uh, so that needs to be happening. And then they need to test if everything is working according to plan. In the meantime, Apple is opting the restriction, the security restriction with each new Mac OS version, which is also the reason why a lot of very old drivers don't run anymore on M1s because they cannot work over the security layers that Apple put up. That is a different thing, but is also the same problem. Uh, I'm not sure if Jeroen has something to add to this discussion. Well, not. I think you covered 
the majority of things uh, pretty well, uh, Peter, in this one, uh, because uh, it's difficult predicting the future. And this is the roadmap of Apple that as an external party, you have to develop along that path. So whatever Apple decides, that's the way it's going to be taken into the future. Um, by the way, you just have me can you put my, my computer back again one more time. Sure. Because what I what I just had before uh, we moved over is that I changed the beat grid and there was a difference in between the edit place and the display place of the beat grid. After rebooting my record box, you will see that those numbers are now updating. If I skip in the beginning tr of the track, you will now see this one properly updated at 130, 130. Here's it's going to increase, and at the end you will see it back at uh, 160. Now, it, the audio was, was fine uh, last time. I just wanted to show you that rebooting record box did help, and perhaps something happened during our setup, or something happened within record box, but now uh, rebooting record box sorted it out. That's what I want to show you. Yeah, a lot of times, just weird things that are going on. The music you hear, by the way, is I think there is a boat coming, passing by. I would say my I car, would say my car is, is not turned on, right? Or, 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 is, <laughs> the, or is it, it comes from the same vicinity, but I have a, a river have running, a river running uh, uh, right uh, next to right our next studio. studio. Uh, and it's uh, like, and 30, and it's degrees like 30, 30 degrees outside, outside so, that means so that means that uh, a, lot, a lot of people are just... Uh, floating right, so you he might hear something in the back. That is actually a boat passing by. Uh, it's gone. It's gone now. If it's not sailing fast enough, I'm going to crank on my subwoofer and we're going to blow it a little bit. <laughs> no, no. But uh, like Jeroen said, often if, if mysterious things are going to happen, first thing is always reboot your computer. If it's a Mac, if it's a Windows computer, it doesn't matter. Reboot it, and rebooting means. Restarting, restarting it, making sure, making sure it, shuts it shuts down, and then bringing it up again. It up again. Uh, there, is there, is there is a different form of rebooting, form of rebooting possible, possible as well, uh, which is uh, you can do a cold restart. That means you really, really, really shuts down your computer. You wait at least 20 seconds, and then you switch it on again. That most definitely makes a lot of problems disappear. And like Jung said, if you just uh, switch off your record box and start it up again, and not only record box, by the way, most software will fix a, a long array of problems that people can have. Uh, step, step, one, step, step one, solving issues. Restart the program that you are using. Doesn't solve it, restart your computer. Or not restart it, turn off, wait 20 seconds, and then turn it on again. Those are the two things that solve I think like 40 to 50 percent of a lot of the issues. So rebooting and resetting, it, it really works guys. And always try that first before you're going to call me. In the uh, hard to answer questions uh, arena, again, uh, our friend AC from YouTube, uh, are you aware of any plans of a rotary mixer coming from Pioneer DJ? You hear those crickets? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, sorry, my, my mic was not turned on. Um, on future products, unfortunately, I cannot give you any details. Even if I know, I cannot tell you because as an employee, it's not up to me. The only thing I can say is that we're always investigating all the possibilities that, that we have. To be honest, I do not think, because this was for V10, right? The question? Yes, not that. Yeah, there was, there was the question the rotary, but a, well, a, a V10 rotary option would be awesome. In the, in the early days, we've had rotary kits for DGM 3000, DGM 600, DGM 800. I was the one to sell those units in the Netherlands, so I know how, how many of them are sold. I'm not so curious for a rotary version, but it has been talked about with a V10, but I don't think it's going to come very soon because of a space issue on the inside. Of course, that can be sorted out. And if there's, there seems to be like a huge demand, Pioneer might change its mind. But at this point in time, there's no rotary option or mixer coming anytime soon. We are ju just lucky with those guys passing by. An update on the boat. 
This is a boat without an engine because there's a guy swimming in front of it. What? <laughs> who's carrying the boat. <laughs> what? Uh, and at least they have got a ghetto blaster that is actually working. Yeah, that, that, that's it. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> it's too bad that I don't have the old side uh, uh, camera anymore, uh, which we had at uh, May 4th for the flag. Uh, then, then I could show it, but <laughs> this is a boat <laughs> that, is, a that boat. is actually that broken. Is actually broken. Your, your mic is still on the me. Yeah, thank you. This is a broken uh, boat uh, with a guy swimming in front of it and a huge sound system. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin says, a V10 rotary option would be awesome. Those options were too early for the market. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree though. Those might be too early to for the market, but uh, Pioneer DJ, Pioneer DJ. Uh, is not a niche developer. They develop for the majority of the DJ market and not for the niche. They leave that more to the zones of this world and the specialized things. But you never know what's going to happen. And let's uh, be uh, honest here. I don't think Rotary mixer, mixer is something of today. Because I still remember for DJM 1000 when we had it, Armin was using it from day one because he wanted to have that Rotary Mixer. Carl Cox has been using my sample for that as well. DJM 800, it didn't went so well. So in our point of view, it's the top end mixer where's the demand for Rotary. I don't think now the time is totally different than it was before. There's always a demand for a Rotary Mixer. That's a style of mixing. It's something completely different than when you're mixing with rotaries, than when you are mixing with faders. So it's not, and yeah, that Pioneer is too fast. We've been there and we've been making that mistake uh, that we want to develop quicker than that the DJs can work up with. Uh, now the rotary for the V10, um, it's, it's not a new feature and it's being investigated. All right, well, that uh, also means that I'm out of questions from the chat. Uh, we are still here for uh, a few minutes, so if you guys have questions, just throw them in the chat and we are happy to answer them. Uh, is the, the focal analysis still? Yeah, that's it's working now. All right, all so right, all right. Because I, yeah, 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 we sorted it we out. Had we had kind of a spare subject, subject that we wanted to do, to do but uh, Jeroen uh, was, was fighting, fighting his Mac because he's basically a Windows guy by heart. So that is all, that's his choice. You cannot blame him for that. But there was another thing that Jeroen was going to cover, so I give the mic back to Jeroen. And just quickly. Oh, it, I, wa I was not unmuted. Sorry about the echo, uh, guys. About the vocal analysis. This is another of the features that's covered by the creative plan. It's actually a very easy feature and it doesn't involve a lot of stuff. If you have a track and you're going to analyze it, let me now explain this pop-up, what you see here. In this pop-up, um, you change the BPM range to what is appropriate for the majority of the tracks that you are going to analyze. If the BPM is not within that range, you have to halfen or double the beat grid values. So if a track would be 95 BPM, I'm almost sure it's 190. The checkboxes that you set decide what you are going to analyze. And if you do not have a creative uh, subscription, your vocal will have a padlock next to it. Um, so you have this checkbox set and what it then does is going to create an additional display in the screen where there might be vocals in the track. So if I'm going to analyze this track again, this little blue part on top is what we call the vocal analysis file. And um, if I'm going to play that, you will see that in the beginning of the track where there's not this blue line, there is only beats. I can skip it a little bit further. Uh, it's just, just one phrase, but here you got the break. You will see the analysis on top here. And it's the blue row here at the bottom. So that's the vocal analysis. This gives you an indication where, oh, I'll stop the track uh, because of music rights. Uh, but you, as soon as you load a track, you will, uh, once the track has been analyzed, this is a track without a vocal. 
And when you get this track, you're going to analyze it again, and then it should show you the vocal analysis. Uh, it also indicates on the left in this icon, you will see this little icon with a blue uh, line. This means I've detected some vocals in this track and it doesn't analyze them in the Let There Be House. That could be either because there's no vocals or the vocals are too short to being highlighted. But you will see as soon as you uh, load a track, you will have the bits on top of it. And this is the vocal analysis and that's also one of the uh, features that you get with the creative paid subscription plan of Recordbox. I think it's sometimes worth to dive a little bit in the deep with it or show you because this is something you hear about and you might not come across this you're if you're yeah. figuring it out yourself. All right, then All right. Uh, our friend AC over at YouTube, uh, he had a pitch for a new, uh, new product, uh, basically uh, a mixer with a computer built in that can run DVS when hooked up to turntables with timecode. Uh, that already exists. I think uh, Qbert is working on that concept as well. Uh, I saw it uh, two years ago at NAM. Uh, not heard much about it anymore. Uh, and you can of course do this if you use algorithms DJ on an iPad which has DVS capabilities nowadays. There are plenty of possibilities to do, to do that out of the box AC, but let's hear if, if, if Jeroen thinks that this would, would possibly be a viable Pioneer DJ product. Well, uh, this is not only a DJ product, but what you're subscribing is basically a computer with some built-in uh, stuff. I don't think it's a good value of resources of spending engineering time for Pioneer DJ to develop a computer that does it all. There are computer manufacturers that do a very good job with it. There's processor manufacturers that make the perfect processor. So I think everybody is good in one of the things. Pioneer is good in audio and computer is something, something different. In the past there's been talking about making a Pioneer disk drive, so like a, a USB drive. But the downside is that if Pioneer starts developing it, once we can bring it to the market, it's already ancient technology because that's moving so fast. So I'm happy for Pioneer to stick within the audio and things like memory cards or computers, leave that to the dedicated manufacturers because they've created them for all their lives and they're very much better in that than an audio uh, company can ever be, I think. Yeah, and, th and yeah. then again, also think about the flexibility that you have with the computer. Windows can be updated, Mac OS can be updated without affecting the functionality of your DJ system or maybe enhancing it even. They can run new DJ software on it that gives you new capability. You are much more flexible if you keep those components separated instead of making it a one in all thing. Of course, I can see the ease of use, the ease of setting up for such a thing. Let's say the RAIN one with a computer inside would be awesome. I personally don't think so. I like the flexibility. The RAIN one is a great controller with all its features, but just leave the controller and leave the uh, processing power up to a computer. Uh, uh, AC is asking, is CDJ a computer, is it not? Mm. At this point in time, it's, it became more of a computer, like the Nexus 2 was a dedicated audio player. Mm, the CDJ 3000 has two ARM chips inside, they, the, they work in tandem and they serve as the MPU of the main process unit of, of that machine. I think CDJ 3000 is the closest to a computer any CDJ has ever been and it's not even there. But it's starting to look like more like a computer and having the MPU also gives Pioneer DJ the opportunity to push more and more difficult updates to the player without that we need to upgrade the hardware. All right, then we have uh, a question from my friend uh, Nick Chetan. Nick, welcome to the stream, by the way. Uh, can you please explain the correct process when using the cloud on the creative plan? I have an external SSD with all my music on that has been imported into Recordbox 6. My confusion is about copying or not the music files and when I want to revert back to how they were will the file structure and folders be changed? All right, ju just for clarification, Nick, are you going to Windows and Mac OS or only staying on 
Mac OS or Windows. So should it be a mixed environment or just uh, to a different Macintosh computer? Because that is a whole different ball game in either situation. But as uh, people might think, I was running against this as well. You probably get triggered because if you look in my collection, you will see, uh, oh, my computer is not even on the screen anymore, but you will see that there's this cloud icon in this first row. This means those tracks are available in my cloud. If I look in my whole collection, you will see that the majority of the tracks are all available in the cloud. I think I run through the same process as you, I don't remember the name, but I, I, Nick. Nick. Uh, I think I run into the same process as you, Nick. Once you have the track, you right click it and then you say move to the cloud. It's going to make an additional folder. It's going to make a whole... That's, 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 that's not, that's uh, not Nick's, uh, uh, Nick's issue. issue. Uh, the problem with Nick is that he has his tracks on an external drive. He is only Mac, Mac OS, he just uh, set that in, 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 which means the file path to the audio files on his external drive is the same no. throughout every Mac OS. The thing is that I tried to, Try to give you a lead up to what I was about to say, how I sorted this whole issue. Because the issue is if you have your tracks on a PC, it starts with the drive letter. If you have your tracks on a uh, Macintosh machine, it starts with a slash and a folder name. I have on my collection, my collection is available on this Macintosh computer and on a Windows PC at home. If I make changes on my PC at home, they are reflected here within my record box. How did I get it to work? Because one of the things that I stress about is that I have my own folder system for my tracks. What record box does with it, I don't like it. So I want to keep my own folder structure, whatever it is, for whatever reason I made my folder structure, I want to keep that. If I listen to your story, you have it on an external drive, you also want to keep that. If you're going to use the creative subscription plan and if you want to use the cloud function, you will need to have a Dropbox account as well because Dropbox is the platform used to share the audio files amongst all the cloud systems that you hook up. I've got the same here and I used to have my music in one of the folders in my music folder. And then when I did in record box, I'm, I'm, I select move to cloud and then it's going to copy them. You have to give them a location and then it's in a file system that I don't want my tracks to be in. So how did I sort it out? What did I do? Well, I moved the, my whole collection is in one folder. There's this one folder called uh, Vinyl Collection, whatever it's going to call it, but this folder has my structure with all the things that I want to have within, within my record box. So for me it's important that this folder structure stays how it is, because this is the way I put my music here on the discs. This Vinyl Collection used to be here in my music folder on my Macintosh. Mind you, I'm using Macintosh here. What I did is I moved that folder, I just grabbed it and I copied and pasted it in my Dropbox. So now you will see in my Dropbox that this vinyl collection folder is within my Dropbox. If you then start up Recordbox, Recordbox will show all your files mixing, missing with that orange exclamation mark. Then, thanks to Recordbox 6, six so, <coughs> sorry, you go to the settings in uh, advanced and then halfway down you will see auto relocate search folders. I specified that one folder with my vinyl collection in my Dropbox. Then you go to uh, file, display all missing files and you hope to see this. If you don't see this, you will see the missing file manager and at the bottom left you will see the button auto relocate. If you've made the changes like I showed you in your advanced settings, Recordbox is going to look in that one folder within your Dropbox. It's going to link all the files again and immediately will show you this cloud icon in front of it because Recordbox automatically detects tracks in Recordbox as available within the cloud. So, 
if I listen to your story, you have an external drive with your folders in it. Go to your Dropbox folder, create a folder with whatever name you have, call it Recordbox Music, My RB Music, I've seen a lot of names, and duplicate your drive in that folder and then use the auto relocator to relink your files and then they should be available within all connected computers that are locked into the same Dropbox account with the same user account within Recordbox. I sorted it and after I told a lot of people, uh, more people are now using it. So this is what I should do. Yeah, the uh, problem with that approach is, is twofold. First of all, uh, if you take your external drive to your other Mac and you sync everything back from the cloud, that means you get the metadata back from the record box cloud, then that should still point to that external drive because on Windows PCs, the drive letter might change if you put the drive into a different computer. On Mac OS, that drive will always be the name. So it is the same, the file path will remain the same. So that should work in theory. However, with the problem I have with Jeroen's approach, which will work by the way, so let me put that first, is that uh, Recordbox uses the Dropbox folder on your home folder, which means it is a Dropbox folder that is on your internal drive. Uh, you can in Dropbox allocate a different folder as your Dropbox folder, but as far as I'm aware, that's not honored by Recordbox. It only takes that Recordbox folder that is in your home folder. Let me show that on my computer real fast so we know what we are talking about. So that is indeed an issue if you have a massive large uh, amount of music that's way too much your main root drive, drive, then you have a conflict, yes. Yeah, and it's a good thing that I now manually mute you because you, <laughs> you forgot it a few times. So I, I now mute you on the deck. <laughs> so I, mute, I must mute you back in order to do that. But you basically acknowledge that, all right, if you have a big collection, then that is going to be an issue. Right here, let me hide. That is from, from last time that we did the show the hidden files thing. Let me hide the... Uh, yeah. This works much easier. There we are. Uh, right here, the Dropbox folder that is used by Dropbox is this particular folder, uh, Dropbox. And you can see on my startup drive, it's only a 100 gig or so left. So that means if I was going to put my two terabyte user collection on that Dropbox folder, it wouldn't fit and it would not go to the Dropbox uh, cloud. Uh, again, in Recordbox, you cannot or at least Recordbox will always look at this Dropbox folder. It will that regard that folder as the Dropbox folder. In the Dropbox Sync Manager, you can specify a different Dropbox folder. Let's hope it is not going to kick in because then it's going to, ah, it's not going to kick in. There we are. And there we have the preferences right there. And let's see. In the sync, I think. Here you can see where stuff should be synced, and here you can say where the Dropbox folder is located. And you can see it is right now on my home folder, which is the standard way. If I were to point it to an external drive, then it will work with Dropbox, but Recordbox will not allow that because it expects the Dropbox folder to be in your home location. So that means that the size of your internal drive is basically going to be the limitation of that will work or not. Uh, again, I'm not a big fan of how Pioneer DJ did implement this. There are better ways to implement it, but we have to face the stuff we have in front of us and not the, the stuff we want because, hey, that is how this works. At least uh, Nick uh, has some options here. Uh, then uh, Greg Amato came along and he says, I see the DDM 900 Nexus 2 is out of stock in every major US retailer. I've got one in front of me, but it's not for sale. Uh, does this mean a new mixer is coming soon? Uh, Craig, uh, you are most likely a little bit late to the stream. You but something. <laughs> but uh, Pioneer DJ, like many, many manufacturers and electronic manufacturers in general, is facing supply issues, which means 
everything is in short supply. Not only your Nexus 2 mixer is in short supply, but the V10 is not available anywhere as well. That is just a supply issue coming from the pandemic. If you want to have all the details, please rewind the stream a little bit because we uh, talked about this in length and explained what is going on because this is an important issue. And since everybody in the business is facing it, it is important that you understand what's going to or what's happening there. Let me unmute Jung for a moment. About the uh, new mixer that is coming, there's always a new mixer, player, controller and headphone coming. It's only not certain in which order and what are the specifications of that model. Pioneer is always working on a new product. At this point in time, the shortages are due to the pandemic and it has nothing to do with any new products that you might suspect be there. Yeah, rule, rule of thumb as with anything that's electronic or computer related, just buy what you need when you can afford, afford it. Don't wait for the next big thing because there's always a next big thing around the corner. But don't buy everything just because you want to buy it. Buy it when you need it and you can afford it. That is uh, the, the, the trick to it. No problem, uh, Craig. We are here to answer any and all questions. So we were happy to answer this one for you. But hey, we, we went into deep with it already. All right, guys. Uh, we are approaching uh, over one hour, but we can go on for three hours if we got enough questions. Otherwise, you will see, you will not believe the amount of bullshit that we can broadcast. But it's not <laughs> a problem for us to <laughs> no. spend another four hours talking about talking about uh, uh, whatever. whatever. But let's try to be efficient and try to answer your guys' questions. And if there's no more questions, just save them for next time when I'm around. If it's Pioneer Evolved. If it's uh, Converter Utility Evolved or any of the things, just drop them in next week at Peter's next stream. At least, right? Yep, yep. We are, uh, I, at least I am here next week. Uh, no guest yet, as far as I'm aware of, but I know some people were interested in passing by the studio as well. So I will announce that if uh, that is hammered out. Uh, any news on the RX3? Asked Nick Chatham. RX3, that sounds like a resistor actually. RX3. <laughs> this is just like uh, DC547B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nick, I, I, I. Nothing I, to say about it, sorry. I, I, I'm afraid uh, there, there is nothing that can be said about any things that might or may not be future things from rotary mixers to RX3s. Uh, we just don't know. And even if we would know, then, then we couldn't. Tell then, then we couldn't <laughs> tell you. So either way, take it however you want it. Uh, all right, my friends. Thank you all for tuning in uh, again and for your questions. Much appreciated because that's why we do this kind of streams. You and I just like to help other GDIs out in the field anyhow we can. Uh, Jeroen, thank you very much for joining me again, uh, even on a very warm summer evening. Well, thank, thank you for thank having, you for having me uh, here uh, again, Peter. I always love it. Um, love the questions that come in. Love the enthusiasm Peter has. And I think it works very well when we're together. Um, I love to be here another time in the future when I have something to say or if you have anything to ask. Uh, AC is asking a question right in He's got another one. He's got yeah, another one. Yeah, yeah, but that, that one is right in my ballpark. Uh, any chance of Rekordbox being able to convert metadata like Denon is doing with Tractor, Serato, Rekordbox, etc. Uh, AC, uh, AC, that is my bread and butter. That is what I do. I make conversion I make software. And if you think that Engine Prime is doing a good job, then check out what check my out. tools can do because you will be blown away. Uh, did he just, did say, he just say Engine Prime overrules your converter utility? No, more it is... <laughs> <laughs> that then doing, is doing it with Tractor. But, but uh, AC, trust me, uh, conversion software is a, a different uh, ballpark. And uh, to be honest, uh, <laughs> no problem, no, no harm, nobody. Uh, uh, the, the thing is that uh, you have to be a real hacker in order to do this kind of stuff. And let's be very honest and clear about it. None of the manufacturers wants a conversion utility to do the stuff it does. They are all very happy if you convert to them. They are all very sad if you convert from them. So net net, they are neutral about those possibilities. But most DJs need them. 
And that is the reason why I say, let's, uh, let's look how Dan and DJ does it. It is not a good solution. It's not a solid solution. There's a lot of things that remain to be, uh, which are missing from it for various reasons. And you can only make those things if you say to your user, all right, I make it, it works now, but if Serato changes something, it will not work because they changed something. If Piney changes something, it might not work because it, it can break and you must accept that. And a company like a Pioneer DJ is too professional to say, all right, we are going to rely on stuff that we cannot control. Like for instance, how Serato stores metadata, they're not going to burn their hands on that. Uh, so don't expect anything like that ever to come from a major brand like a Pioneer DJ, unless they buy Serato, and then of course you will have a fluent conversion in both directions between Rackerbox and Serato. If not, then hey, you have to rely on guys like me because we can do things that they cannot do. Basically because we are independent people who don't have a very big name above us other than the Entity Crew Remains production team. And of course I want my tools to, to be as complete and as good as I can make them and they are constantly improved and if things are changed I, I try to catch up but there might come a po point in time where I'm unable to catch up and then I just simply say sorry guys I cannot do it and that is not something that a Piney DJ can do. So for that kind of stuff you always have to turn for me uh, to me. Good news is it only costs a few bucks so uh, it won't break it it, it 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 really won't break the bank for you um any other questions folks i don't think so um i'm not going to look who we are going to rate in today because i saw that twitch is really slowing down in traffic uh because most people are either on vacation or are working again <laughs> which is both a good thing of course but not very good for the people who are broadcasting on twitch number wise thank you all for watching See me next week. I'm not sure what the subject will be on the ATGR Facebook page. You can always find out what the subject will be. Don't forget to like, subscribe and all that other good stuff uh, about this stream. And see you all next time. And Jeroen, I hope Jeroen, you, will, I be hope you will be back soon when we have a yeah. bloodload of questions. questions. We're going to be back. I, I promise, you. promise you. I'll be back sometime in the future. For now, thank you for attending and see you next time.